Since that's the name of the course, right? So then you've already designed, you've already, you've already defined a sensor. A sensor is a device that converts a physical stimulus into an electrical equipment. Uh, hopefully we understand that we have all types of sensors on our body and it does exactly the same thing, right? Uh, transfer function. This is the ratio between the physical stimulus and the electrical equipment. Uh, I think uh, in PLCs, so uh, in PLCs, uh, when we bring in an analog uh, sensor, uh, usually uh, so what's analog? Uh, analog is something that could vary between two set points in an infinite number of variations. That's true analog. So most of life varies in analog, right? I understand that. It's like you're trying to get here every day. And you start off at point zero and then you come up here and end up at the college. How many inches did you go through? A lot, right? How many million inches did you go through? So if we went, the further we went down, the more that we would approach infinity, right? Even though we don't understand, understand infinity. Uh, normally, uh, in, in, uh, motor controls, and we have different ways we can send, uh, what, what, how would we send it? Uh, what what three electrical quantities are we dealing with? Voltage. Yeah, or current. Which one can't we use? We can't. We can't use it. So I mean, so I'm gonna if I'm gonna <coughs> use an analog quantity. Then we're either going to convert it into a voltage, or we're going to convert it into an equivalent voltage, or we're going to convert it into an equivalent current. <coughs> that makes sense. Everybody okay? <coughs> and of course, the, probably the most predominant method of use is, of course, is a voltage. But what's the problem with voltage? Yeah, it's almost impossible to maintain a precise voltage over distance. Because if I'm going to send a voltage, we've got to send it into a resistance. If I send it into a resistance, we're going to generate a current. If I put current through a conductor, every conductor has a resistance, so every conductor is going to lose some voltage over the wire, over the conductor. So it's almost impossible to guarantee that we have exactly a voltage. Also, voltage is immune to uh, EMI. What's EMI? Electromagnetic interference. So anytime we have a metal conductor, and then I pass a magnetic field through that metal conductor, it's going to do what? It's going to induce a voltage into that conductor. So using voltage, used to using voltage, it was very susceptible to EMI. So anytime we have something that generates a magnetic field, unfortunately, anytime we put current through a conductor, it generates a lot around it, a magnetic field. So that's why we come up with electromagnetic interference. Electromagnetic interference could cause problems with our voltage too. So we did all this shielding. We did all these different types of methods that we used to send the voltage. Um, originally what we did is we sent them in what we call, what, what became known as single ended. Where we would do is we would take one conductor and we would call this a signal wire. Even though there's current flow on both wires, and then the return conductor, if we're using DC, uh, this would be reference to ground or calm. So what was happening is that when an electromagnetic interference passed through the signal wire, we would induce a voltage into this, but you can't induce a voltage into ground because that's what everything's referenced to. So what would happen is we'd get these pulses or this interference on our signal wire. 
so what we would, uh, what we started doing, of course, was encapsulating this in a shield, and then we would take the shield on one end and we would connect the shield around. And uh, shields are not supposed to be connected to ground on both sides. Anybody know why? Makes them a current there. That's exactly right. It's almost impossible to keep two pieces of equipment at the exact ground potential over distance. Everybody understand that? So I might walk into my, how many grounds do you have in your house? Usually one. And that's going to be over by your meter box. You know, and then you get to the other end of your house. If you was to take a meter on one end of your house and hook it into your ground there, and then run a wire all the way to the where it's at the meter box, you'll see there was a voltage potential between those two grounds. So if I have a difference in a voltage potential, then we have current flow through the ground, and all of a sudden we lose our shielding capabilities, right? You understand? As soon as I turn it into a current conductor. Because if I induce the voltage into that ground, then it's going to give me a, it's going to shift my voltage the other way. Everybody understand that? Yes or no? So, uh, you know, if I had 24 volts right here and my ground was setting at 2 volts, then what I would see over here, I wouldn't see 24 volts. I would see what? I'd see 22 volts, right? You understand? Because of the 2 volt watt ground shift. Yeah. So, uh, single-ended is still pretty popular, but uh, we got away from single-ended. And, but what we're about to do, now we use an interface called differential, which we'll talk about later on. But what, we have a problem with voltage. The other thing they refer to is a current loop. So uh, what they usually use, is the most popular current loop is what we call uh, 20 to 40 milli. Is that right? 20 to 40? I, I should know that. So what we do is we use one current to represent a zero uh, level, and then we use another current to represent a maximum level, and then any level between that would represent a level. And what's the advantage of current loop or the voltage? Not necessarily. Voltage is weak. It's, it's more reliable. It's more the problem with these little old pulses that pass through this guy. So normally signal leads are high high impedance leads, which means uh, if I'm using voltage and I'm using a high impedance source or a channel, then it's going to be very easy to induce a voltage into the wire because it's dealing with an extremely high resistance. It's almost impossible for an EMI to generate a current because it's a low resistance circuit, right? You understand? And it's just like me, you know, um, I, I charge up to a lot of voltage, we call it a static electricity, but I can't get any work out of it. Why can't I get any work out of it? Because my body has so much resistance, and as soon as I try to get work out of my static electricity, the voltage drops down to zero because of my high impedance load, right? You understand? So my static electricity cannot generate a current. All it's going to generate is a wall. The voltage, right? You all understand that? So it's very easy, since I'm a high impedance source, my body's picking up stuff all the time. Uh, I don't have an oscilloscope in here, but uh, I should. Uh, but I can come up here. I don't, I don't have a camera. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. So this, this oscilloscope, Let's 
So this is EMI. This is electromagnetic interference. So I have magnetic waves flowing through, crossing into my body, right? You understand? And it's inducing a voltage into me right now. Now, I can't get any work out of that, right? You understand? Because my body, my source has so much internal resistance. But this is me right here. Now, what do you think if I measure that frequency? What would be the predominant frequency? 60 hertz, because of Alabama power. I mean, Alabama power is, how many conductors do we have generating Alabama power up here? Tons of them, right? Got current flow through those conductors, current flow through those conductors generates a magnetic field, and my body picks that up. But even though I'm getting this voltage, but it's only we can measure it. So that's 100 millivolts per degree. So just me, that's uh, 100, uh, 100, 200, 400, 500, 600, over, over half a volt that's in my body. But if I try to run a load that was rated at a half a volt, as soon as I come up here and try to get work out of it, if I can do that, my body Let's take it back. So this is not really, but see what happens when I try to get work out of it? It basically drops down on the floor. Nothing. Well, this works out real well. I mean, we use this all the time. Where's an application where we use this and do both all the time? Okay. Well, let's see this is this is a capacitance touch screen. That's all it is. So when I come up here and touch this thing, it's using that induced voltage. This is an extremely high impedance source, and it's using that induced voltage to determine what where my finger is on the screen. So that's capacitance. We have different types of touch screens. We have capacitance touch screens, which basically will operate on a lot of stuff. And then we have what they call resistance touch screens, where you literally have to put pressure on. You have to put a lot of pressure on them to the... What's that? That's why my hand doesn't work like You got to use something that has capacitance, something that picks up a signal. Well, you know, it don't work because it's not it's not right. it's not a conductor, right? It right. Don't, it, I just, that's what I said. I just had the <laughs> But if you had a if you had a resistive screen like on our HMI panels over there, so our HMI panels are our human machine interface deals with people that wear gloves all the time. These are industrial, right? You understand? So I cannot use a capacitive screen on those. I use a resistive screen. So that's why you gotta press on those. So what you got is you got membranes in there that varies the resistance when you put pressure on it. And that's the way they sense that. So those are capacity, those are resistance screens. But you gotta do what on them? You gotta put pressure on them. Uh, these you don't have to put pressure on. I mean, you just get up there and as soon as you touch them, you move them around. And you can buy things that actually pick up that, that EMI, right? The electromagnetic interference. And you can, you can buy pins that's got the little rubber tips on them. But you can't put, you can't use your striker. And when you hit it with your fingernail, right? It don't work. That was the last uh, Transylvania. My, I have grandkids. Hotel Transylvania. And they got, what's his name, a cell phone. And he has these long fingernails. And he was tapping on them trying to make it work. <laughs> and he, he couldn't. Uh, he couldn't do it. Uh, so, uh, no, I'm sorry. It's 4 to 20. I knew I'd get that right in a minute. So what's nice about current loops is they're basically immune to electrostat uh, EMI because uh, that EMI cannot generate a watt, a current. It cannot generate a current. As soon as we try to load it, if it comes through there, that little impulse of voltage just disappears because it can't generate a, a current. But if I've got a real high impedance source, then if I was using a voltage, it would definitely it would definitely change that, right? You understand that? So, but what we're going to have a ratio is between this and then what we're measuring. So, if I'm measuring a weight, well, that weight is going to be transferred over to a current. But let's use a voltage, it's easy to use. So, let's say uh, 2,000 pounds would give me 10 volts. Well, what I could do now is once I know if it's linear, then now what I can do is I can figure out, okay, how much does each volt, how much is each volt worth? 
So I could come up here and we call this the transfer function. I could come over here and take 10 and divide it by 2,000. And that would give me something called votes per pound. Right? You understand that? So now I can say, okay, if I get five votes, then that, if I get five votes, if I did all the math, that would mean I was looking at a thousand pounds. Right? You understand? So we call these transfer functions. In PLCs, they call it scaling. That's what you do. You scale. You say, okay, 10 votes equals this. And then, uh, that's basically what you're doing is doing a transfer function. So every PLC now has the ability to do what they call scaling, which where we can take a, a, a signal like a current and then convert it over to what that value of that current actually means, right? You understand? That makes sense. So we'll look at transfer functions and try to figure out transfer functions on different sensors. And these are normally deal with analog sensors. Digital sensors. What do we mean by digital sensors? So at, we have sensors that fall into different categories. Uh, we have what we call digital sensors and analog sensors. What would be the difference of a digital sensor and analog? Not necessarily. A limit switch would be a digital sensor. It's going to give us back what it measures. If it's giving it back a, a voltage, it will give us one voltage when it is closed or true, and it'll give us another voltage when it's what false. Usually zero in some voltage. Uh, here we're going to be dealing with 120 volts AC. So now, if it's a 120 volt AC sensor, that means when it's true, it's going to let 20, 120 volts pass through. When it's false, it's going to let what? Zero volts pass through. That makes sense. If it was an analog sensor, then it would give us back an equivalent that of to what it wants to measure. So like a temperature sensor. If I wanted to measure the temperature, that would be what? Analog sensor. But if I wanted to trip at a certain temperature, then we would go through something we call an analog to digital converter. So like your, your thermostat on your house. Uh, the temperature sensor in there is an analog sensor. If it wasn't an analog sensor, you couldn't come up there and set that thing up to any, any temperature you want to. But what we have the ability to do is we have the ability to set up a threshold circuit. It's very, it's not hard and we can set the threshold and the output of the, the sensor would give us a zero as long as the analog was below that level. And as soon as it crossed that threshold, it would do what? It would switch, and that's what you're doing. So when you go on your uh, on your thermostat and your, your air conditioner, you're setting the threshold. And as soon as the temperature uh, depends on whether you're heating or cooling, if it, you're heating, which is on cooling what we're doing now, as soon as it goes past that threshold. So the sensor itself is an analog sensor. But inside your thermostat, you have an A to D converter, right? You understand? That looks for a wall, a threshold. And as soon as it eats that threshold, then what happens? Your air conditioner turns on. And as soon as it drops below that threshold, your air conditioner goes off, cuts off. So we go through what we call, a lot of our sensors are truly analog sensors. But we can incorporate an A to D converter in there and give us the ability to generate a digital output. Does that make sense? And so when we move over to our temperature sensor, that's what we're going to have. We're going to have little rings on the side that we 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 come up and we can adjust it. Where we're going to do what? What are we actually doing? Setting the threshold. Yeah. So a lot of our sensors are predominantly uh, digital sensors. Uh, in fact, all the sensors we'll be using here are going to be, as far as the control circuit is concerned, they're going to be digital, but some of them are going to have A to D converters in them. Uh, like our pressure sensor, we have a pressure sensor. And it's neat, it's truly digital. It's got a digital readout on it. But we have, but we're going to send it into a dis digital control circuit, so we're going to have the ability to do what? Set the threshold. Some of them, our temperature sensor, we can set an upper and lower threshold. So what happens, it'll trip the upper, and then if it drops below that, it don't trip it. It'll wait till it gets what below the lower threshold. And what we have different, what we can set, what we call the span. Some temperatures you get, like your compressor. Your, if you've got a compressor, it has a it has a sensor like that. So what happens is when it gets below a certain pressure, the compressor turns on until it hits an upper threshold, and it turns off. 
and then it starts dropping, but it don't turn on when it drops below the upper threshold. What does it do? It waits till you get to the lower threshold. So we have those type of sensors too, where we can set what what we'll refer to as a dead band. It's also called a, a span. So the transfer function is the ratio between the physical stimulus and the electrical stimulus. So we did a transfer function for a, a force sensor that looked at what? Looked at weight. First of all, you need to be able to reference the output to a weight. Normally what we do is we use the maximum weight. Uh, then we do that. Uh, so what we did uh, uh, when we calibrated scales, we had these calibrated scales, these calibrated weights. And then we would go out there and put those calibrated weights on the scale, and these were analog sensors. And then we'd go on our indicator and set it for that weight. And then we'd take the weight off, and what would happen is it would shift. The zero would shift. Then we'd take the weight off and we'd reset the zero, right? You understand? And then what would we do? We'd put the weight back on there, and we'd have to go between that to actually get this. Uh, the span signal. And that's the way we used to set the calibrate. But we had to start off with a, a known quantity, right? Uh, cal we call them calibrated weights. And we had to take our weights down to Montgomery every year and check the calibration on it. No, it was all over. I worked for a, when I was laid off from U.S. Steel, uh, I got a job. They brought a, a uh, they brought a uh, outside contractor in to work on. We called it the lime scales. I don't know what they call them now. Uh, it, they were they were uh, they were going crazy, and they brought a, an outside contractor called Air Equipment in to fix the scales. And at that time, if you brought an air, if you brought an outside contractor in, when I worked at U.S. Steel, you had to put somebody with a date a, 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 like an electronic repairman with them. So they couldn't just come into the plant. That was, that was union. Union said, you can't pay these people without paying our people. So I went over there and had the uh, pleasure of working with these guys. So uh, when I got laid off from U.S. Steel, guess who, guess who hired me? Uh, that scale company. So I learned a lot about scales. Uh, so uh, so I, I was actually certified scale technician. So I could calibrate scales. Which was pretty neat, and I kind of was avoided that. Suppose you're supposed to go to Montgomery and take a test, but they just gave it to me. So kind of funny. But uh, we had to take them down every year. I worked for that company for probably for a year and a half before they called me back to U.S. Steel, and then they shut it down for what? They shut it down to build the, the pipe. They shut the plant down to build the pipe. Uh, what are the five basic sensors? Now, we talk about basic sensors, but hopefully you understand that the human body has a ton of sensors that most people don't talk about. So what do we say our five basic sensors are? Yeah, we have what? These are the five basic sensors. We have smell, we have taste, touch, sight, touch. But in actuality, how many sensors do we have that most people want to talk about? What other sensors do we have? Well, we can sense temperature, which is not up there, right? We can sense temperature. And we can sense we can sense force. Equilibrium. We can sense we can sense equilibrium. We have the ability to balance. You know, we're an amazing species. Uh, for all practical purposes, we shouldn't be able to walk. And why is that? Because the, the where our center of gravity is, our center of gravity is set up so we should be falling all the time, which is basically that's what we're doing when we walk, <laughs> right? We start to fall, and then we do what? Move our leg and catch ourselves. It's a, it's just like those uh, satellites. Satellites are constantly falling, but they're falling at a, a rate that's equal, either equal to or greater than what the Earth is changing, right? Understand? So we're doing basically the same. So basically, uh, the sense is uh, temperature. We can sense temperature. We can sense uh, sense of location of the parts of the body. I think you have to what you were talking pro pro picture. So I know I know where my hands are. That's what we're saying. I know where my feet are. Right? You understand? Except for this guy right here, because this is parallel. Uh, but we know that. We know that. And that's not one. They don't call that. Part of our five basic sensors, uh, we can sense pain. 
Uh, we can send equally equal liberal conversation, balance, motion, gravity. We can send gravity, right? Pressure. We can sense pressure. We can sense hunger. Now that uh, we know when we need to what eat. Uh, thirst. We we get thirsty, right? You understand that we we get nausea. We get sick. So we know when to throw up. We know when we get something in our body that's foreign to us and it needs to come out. Uh, stretch receptors, your lungs, your bladder, your stomach. So we know we need we need to go to the bathroom. Uh, we know when we need to breathe. We know when we need to eat, right? We know when we need to go uh, sit on the pot for a little while. So these are analog versus digital. We okay. So analog is continuous signal varying over a physical quantity. And basically, we use either voltage or what? Current. In this class, we're going to use primarily voltage. Okay. Uh, advantages, we have an infinite number of values, more accurate, requires less bandwidth, lower cost. Acceptable, we have what? Right. Right. Very hard to do what? Almost impossible to store and use later. Right. Hard to process by a computer, hard to interpret. Digitals. Uh, what's digital? The quantity that we're trying to measure varies over discrete steps. Usually this is it. That shouldn't be. It's usually voltage, but it could also be current. It should add that in. Advantage of digital. Easier to process by a computer. Easier to transmit. Easier to store. Resolution depends on the number of binary bits. And disadvantages to higher cost. And of course, basically, a lot of things are going to be digital, but we still have to understand that analog is something that in, in control systems, in some control systems, we can't live without, right? You understand? So we have these devices called analog to digital converters. which a lot of people refer to as DAX. It makes an acronym. And then if we're going to go from analog to digital, then we need to be able to be able to, be able to do what? Which is less popular. And we don't have a real acronym for that. We just call it an ABC. So analog to digital will give me the ability for my process, my section to bring in an analog signal and convert it to what digital, and then it also gives my controller the ability. If we got analog to digital conversion to go from digital inside our computer to analog for the outside world. Are we okay? So and digital, we we can transmit it. If I'm sending. If I'm sending ones and Z or voltages or no voltages, then the voltages can vary over a range and still be considered legal, right? You understand? If I'm trying to send five volts to represent a thousand pounds, then now that's where I get into problems, right? You understand? But if I can send a sequence of pulses that represents five thousand pounds, then that gives me the ability to, to make it true over a range. Does that make sense? So we can actually say, okay, if it's above this range, so a digital, uh, we call it uh, transistor, transistor logic. Uh, this uses five volts. So what would be considered a, a digital one or a true? Anybody know? Huh? It's going to be a range. It's not going to be five volts. It's going to be a range. So basically, it's anywhere from 2.4 volts up to up to 7 volts, really. So now I've got this range, right? You understand? I'm not trying to say 5 volts equals 2,000 pounds, right? You understand? So I could convert this into a, a sequence of 1s and zeros and send it as digital, and I could send it over a greater distance without worrying about losing voltage. Now the zero is a little a uh, little more precise. The zero is anywhere from between I think minus 0 0.7 up to 0 0.8, uh, which would be 800 millivolts. But they usually don't give it in a uh, millivolts. They usually give it in volts. 
And then anything between 800 millivolts and 2.4 volts would be considered, we call that invalid. Now your digital circuits is going to take it at something, but there's no guarantee what, what your input will take as a, as a true and what it will take as false. So we still call that invalid. But now when we're dealing with digital, now we have the ability to add compensate for, for loss in the system, right? You understand that? Because now we have a range, because now we're not dealing with a, with a voltage. We're dealing with a range of voltages, which one would be considered true and one would be considered false. Well, now these would be digital converters. We've also got the ability to take a, a, a quantity and represent it as a as what we call a binary number. So a ten in binary uh, would be equal to this. And what I would do is I would take this and maybe send it over four different conductors, and we call that parallel. Or we could send it in what we call serially. And what does serially mean? Yeah, I would come over here and I would send these out one after the other. And then set up some timing sequence so the guy inputting it would have the ability to do what? Represent that. Uh, so some A some A to D converters actually take an, take an analog quantity and convert it over to a, a not, not a one or a zero. It converts it over to a binary number. Does that make sense? Right. Uh, and it all depends on the resolution, how, how accurate it is. So here we would say, uh, we call it volts per step or something like that. So here, uh, if I had one volt, then that would be a one. If I had two volts, uh, but I'm going to lose a lot of resolution. So if I only use these four digits, uh, then this, this combination right here would represent a zero. This combination right here would represent one vote. This combination right here would represent two votes. This combination right here would represent three votes. That makes sense. This combination here would represent four votes. Uh, this combination here would represent five votes, right? That makes sense. With four bits, I could go up to 15 votes. But what happens is, what happens if I've got 2.3 votes? Well, see, I'm on, so if I only use four bits, then I'm going to lose a lot of resolution, Don't right? Huh? Don't use. Well, no, we'll have to. If I'm dealing with an analog quantity, a true analog quantity means I have an infinite number of combinations between two votes and three votes. So what we're going to have to do when we go through these, these digital A to D converters that actually gives us a binary number is we're going to have a certain resolution. So they're not going to be perfect, right? And, how many bits you're going to use? Most of them use uh, use 10 bits, uh, which gives us 1,023 steps. So that means if I put 10 volts in, I could come up here and I would divide that by 1,023, and that would give me the number of volts per step, right? Does that make sense? But still, it's still not going to be perfect. So the problem we have with with uh, with A to D converters in digital is that if we're trying to get a true analog value, it's going to depend on the number of bits that you use. And the more bits that you use, the more memory it's going to occupy inside your computer. Standard is 10 bits. Uh, I think the uh, the analog inputs on the uh, Siemens 1200s, I think those are 11 bits. So they would they would be they would have a better they would have a better resolution of converting converting a, a analog quantity over into a digital number. And then once you've got it in digital, what can your computer do with that? Well, good gracious. Computers love buying. They love digital. They can do anything you want to. And so what we would do after that is we would scale it to, to now where each one of those steps would mean something, right? You see? Which would be a pretty neat. So what I can do with digital is, number one, is I can process it with a computer. Another thing I can do is I can do what? I can store it, so that means I don't have to use it instantly. I can store it and use it later. Right? You understand that? Uh, I can transmit it because now we're not dealing with a certain current. We're not dealing with a precise voltage. We're dealing with voltages that are what? Over a range. They can compensate for EMI. And then the new interfaces that we use, uh, we still use a lot of uh, 
we call it coaxial cable. Y'all familiar with coaxial cable? That's what they run into the back of your TV. That's what the, uh, it, it's a single ended interface. Uh, we're going to something we call twisted pair and we'll look at what it is. I'm using what we call differential. But the resolution depends on the what? Yeah, the number of bits you use. The more bits you use when we're converting an analog signal over, we're not talking analog to digital. Analog to digital is pretty precise because we're going to set a water threshold. And that's not usually done in the computer. That's usually done in the sensor. So most of these sensors we'll look at, I have a little set screw or something somewhere, and you'll be able to do what? You'll be able to adjust that threshold. And we'll look and see if some of those uh, over there on the manufacturing line. Uh, we had a problem where we had a section of the line that would constantly get uh, stuck every once in a while. And what we do on the ma on the manufacturing line is we're putting together uh, what we call single acting cylinders. And they have a little hole on the side where this is where the air goes in. Well, the problem is, is they were using a sensor that was depending on reflection. So every once in a while, that hole would line up with the sensor and the sensor wouldn't see it. And it wouldn't know that device was there. So what would happen, it would try to feed another one in there because it thought it was empty. Uh, so what did we have to do? Well, we went in and changed the sensitivity on the sensor. So now it would reflect enough light to see so it would on the hole. And we finally figured that out. It would just happen every once in a while. And it was the black, it was the black, it was the black cylinders. Just every once in a while, it would feed another one into there before the, before the robot come and picked it up. And then all of a sudden it dawned on me that every time it did, it was on what? The black ones. Yeah. Because the light it uses, the sense it is, is red and uh, the other sensors are red. So red gives us a lot of reflection and black gave us very little. So, uh, then when we, when I realized that, I had just adjusted it. Now we don't have any problem. So this is an example of analog and digital. So digital, what we do is we set up a sample rate. So if we were looking at a digital oscilloscope, one of the things they tell you is how often does it go out and sample the analog signal. So I got to go from analog to digital, which means I can't constantly go out and check it if I'm going to go if I'm going to take a digital quantity, right? Understand that. So uh, we refer to this as a sample. So what we end up with is a digital representation, which is what uh, we end up with numbers that represent how often it's what? Sample. So the higher your sample rate is, the more, the better resolution. Resolution means what? Anybody know what resolution is? Accuracy, yeah. We use that term resolution. So, the, the, so we got two things that determine the rate, re, re, resolution is the sample rate. How often does it go out there and do what? Look at that input and then convert it over to a binary number. And then, of course, uh, how many bits do you use to, to do that? So if your sample rate is real slow, then what would happen if my input was doing this and I was only sampling right here, then I would miss what? Oh, and that's this right there. So your higher the sample rate is, the more accurate you are, the more precise you represent the analog quantity. But it takes up more time. You're talking about more high-speed processors, more complicated your system has, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Like on the computer, it says something time, something. So it says how many times it access. No, no, no. That's the refresh rate. Oh, okay. A resolution on a screen. So what we do on a on a screen is we your screen is split up into little old units. Uh, we used to call triads. Now they look a little different. And one of them's red, and one of them's uh, green, and one of them's blue, and then it's on a black dot background. And what we do is we combine these into individual triads, or combine it into something we refer to as a pixel. A pixel is a combination of triads that you use to, to create colors. Uh, so what you're doing is you're setting the pixel resolution. And so your screen is split up in rows and columns. And inside this row would be a pixel. So what you're doing is you're defining the number of rows and number of columns. 
So the more rows you identify and the more columns you identify, that means it, your screen's going to have a better resolution. It's going to be sharper, right? Because now the elements are smaller. Uh, we call it pick. I don't know if you've ever been on the on YouTube and you'll see a, a video jump up and you actually see squares up there. Or if you if you expand something out, uh, we call that pixelation. It means the, the the pixels are so dang big you can actually do what you can actually see them. You know. Uh, pixel, you see that pixel eight every once in a while. You'll see it every once in a while on your cable. T you'll see it on your cable TV. All of a sudden, you'll see these squares pop up. But well, what's happened is they something's happened to the bandwidth, and they're not able to send those things out fast enough. So that's what you're doing, pixel resolution. So now you know. This has nothing to do with sample rate, huh? Well, it all depends. Most of your computers give you the ability to set the pixel resolution over what your video, what your video controller uh, can handle. So right now, this is 1080 by 700, but these are the different pixel resolutions that's supported by uh, by this computer. Uh, the higher the pixel resolution that you set, the sharper your picture is, but the more processing time your computer's taking up just playing around with your wall. Your display, yeah. <laughs> so the lower you can make it, your faster your computer will process information. But you start, you start uh, getting. Yeah, a lot of your, uh, some of your videos. If you, if you got a picture you've taken with your camera, and you put it into a, you put it into an application where you can start blowing that sucker up. Eventually, you're going to see what. You're going to see the squares. You're going to see the actual pixels because that's what you're expanding. You're expanding the size. Now, what we don't see here is what we call the refresh rate. The refresh rate is how often they send those pictures to your screen. So your screen is actually doing pictures. But it's doing it as a rate that we our eyes can't do what? Yeah, it's like these lights. I know these lights are turning off 120 times a second, right? You understand that? These fluorescent lights are turning off 120 times a second. Yeah, because it's AC. And when your AC drops to zero, these lights turn off. But our eyes don't see it. Our eyes see them on where? All constantly because our eyes are refreshing. Our brain refreshes slower than what that happens. Uh, movies are what? A sequence of individual pictures. But they flash them by at a certain rate that your eyes, they're below the refresh rates on your eyes. You know? So you can see like props on airplanes every once in a while or cars when they're driving. It looks like the wheels are actually doing what? Thinking backwards because they're spinning at a rate. It's in sync with your refresh rate on your eyes. I like to know the refresh rate on eyes. I know it's out there somewhere. How 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 fat how how often does your brain take a picture of what's coming in? You know. Yeah. Look it up. I know it's on the internet somewhere. <laughs> so your eyes is literally your brain is really doing this, right? You understand that? And if, if if I can if I can do that faster than the refresh rate on my eyes, then it appears to us uh, movies are what in motion, or or these lights will appear to be on on. So I don't know what they do with uh, with the LEDs. I imagine the LED it's hard. The LEDs might be on all the time because they might take the AC and convert it to DC and then put it on the LEDs. Uh, the LED the new LED lights that's very very popular now. I need to look that up too. So we'd have to take the same process if I'm going from analog, if I'm going from digital analog, right? You understand? We would send them at a, we would send them at a, a, a refresh rate on one of the uh, scan rates, and then it would take that, an, that that analog number, I mean that digital number, and convert it over to a voltage that it represents. Well, I'll take it. This is an analog scope right here, so it'd be real smooth. But uh, what I'll do uh, when we get over to the other classroom is I'll bring out one of our digital scopes and let y'all see a sine wave and we'll break it up and you'll actually see it's in step. It's actually stepping because they're taking an analog signal and converting it to what? Digital. But then they're taking that digital and reconverting it back to an analog display. Uh, it's actually, you can actually see the steps. You can actually see the sample rate. Voltage is most often used. Uh, the advantage of current. If you get out in the industry that's been around a while, you're going to run into 420 milliamp current. So, 
Uh, we do have 4 to 20 milliamp uh, inputs that we can buy for PLCs. We could take that current and convert it over to a binary because this is still extremely popular in, in, uh, in industry because it's almost it's almost immune to wire. Am I? Because that, that little old pulse flying through that wire cannot conduct the current. It can create a voltage into a high impedance source, but it can generate a voltage into a low impedance source. The problem we have with current loops, of course, these guys are running all the time. So these guys are fairly expensive. I mean, four, four milliamps. 4 to 20 milliamps, that's 4 milliamps is there all the time, right? You understand? Even if it's sitting there doing nothing, it's still sending 4 milliamps through that conductor. So these guys are more expensive because you're paying for current now, like you're paying for power. Uh, uh, what we've come up with voltage, though, is we've come up with a, another interface called differential, which is almost a new sort of electricity. So this is uh, the new, uh, it's not new. Uh, it's probably the most often used new method of, of sending uh, analog information is using what we call uh, differential. But you're still going to run into one. And why is that? Because the industry has a tendency, if they've got something that's doing exactly what it needs to do and it's giving them very little problems, they're not going to move on. They're not going to change it. Well, that's the problem of working out at US Steel. You run into stuff that's very modern, and then you're running stuff that's still uh, real old, yeah. But we don't use, uh, normally if we're going to use a sensor that has, that, that senses with resistance, inside the sensor we'll convert it to what? A voltage or a current. Or we'll, or we'll do it where we receive it. We'll have to, what we do, I, all we have to do uh, to, to turn a resistance into a voltage is run it through a resistor, right? I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, we can come over here. If I, if I come over here and I had a sensor that generates, a, that changes its resistance uh, with, if I came up here and gen, uh, changes its resistance with what it's measuring, then what would we measure? Well, if this is 10 volts, then this over here would always be 10 volts. So what's varying? The current, right? Or I could come over here and I can come over here and I can take that sensor and then I can run it through a second resistor that's a fixed resistor. So this is fixed. And then, then I take my output right there and there's my sensor. So if this guy right here varies, it's going to vary the current. So if I raise this, the current's going to go up. This guy's going to, this guy's going to drop less voltage. It means this voltage at this point will go up. If this, if this resistance goes down, there's going to be more current. This guy's going to drop more voltage, which means that voltage there would go down. So all I need to do is to take a take a sensor that changes it with the resistance, hook it in hook it in series with a fixed resistor, right? You understand? And now now the sensor will appear to generate a voltage. That makes sense. You measure well. That's basically what you're doing. And you can change the the orientation. So I could actually put my sensor up here. So now this would make more sense. So what would happen if, if I come over here and I, if I use a 10 volt uh, source that's powering my sensor. Uh, now when this resistance goes down, this guy here is going to drop less voltage, which means this guy here has got to drop a lot more. So now my voltage will go up when my sensor output goes up or vice versa. It depends on what type of sensor it is. Uh, what, what does the sensor do? So uh, temperature sensors, we have what we call negative temperature coefficients and positive. Negative means their resistance goes down when their temperature, when the temperature of the measure goes up. The other one means if it's a positive uh, t temperature coefficient, a PTC uh, temperature sensor, then it means this resistance would go up when the temperature goes up. Now the ones we have, I think those are uh, ETCs or negative temperature coefficients. So if it's negative, then if we needed the voltage to go up, then we would use a system like this. Now we're going to add to this, because right now this don't really mean anything. Well, that's no, that's no, that's no big problem. We could run that to the A to D. But let's say uh, when this thing here is sitting at, uh, let's use centigrade. Let's say it's centigrade. It's it's 500 ohms. And then it's set to go up to uh, 100 degrees centigrade, and let's say that's like 5K. 
But when this thing's setting at zero, I'm going to still have a voltage out of there. But I got to make that, that voltage mean zero, right? You understand? So we're going to have to come up with a method where I can set the span, where I can establish what, what, what my analog input actually means. You understand what I'm saying? Does that make sense? So, you know, if I get, if I get 500 millivolts out of here, and I, we're not going to, we can calculate it, but if I get 500 millivolts out there, what temperature is that? Well, if I don't set it relative to something, right, you understand. If I don't set it relative to something, of course, what we would do is we would set it relative to zero, right? Especially centigrade. Uh, probably if it was a Fahrenheit scale, I would set it relative to 32 degrees. Or I could still set it relative to zero, right? You understand? Everybody understand that? So I could set it relative to zero, and now every because anything above zero would still be positive. You understand? So one degree would still be positive. It just that it would be above freezing. So I could set it relative now. If I had some way where I could set this voltage relative to zero, then every one of those voltages would mean something, right? Y'all understand what I'm saying? And so, uh, back in, uh, back in, uh, DC, uh, you played around with something called a Wheatstone Bridge. And I'll draw it and show you what we needed Wheatstone Bridge for, but that's what we'll look at later. So what we'll do is we'll put this as part of a Wheatstone Bridge, and then we'll have the ability to set zero. What zero means. So what, what we have to do is we have to, anytime I'm going to measure something, we have to do it relative to something, right? Understand? It's just like your meter. If you take that red lead and stick it into something, it's going to go crazy because you hadn't set up the measurement relative to something. So what you have to do is you have to establish a z what what the what the reference is, right? So you got a black lead that you do what you stick into the circuit somewhere, and now your measurements are relative. Now we set some. Now we set a relative point. So now your meter is going to measure a voltage drop relative to some point. So what we're saying is we got to make these these voltages and these currents relative to something, right? You understand that? Uh, so uh, we have different sensor outputs. How are we doing? Do we need to take a break? I think it's just about time. Sensor outputs, and this is where we might stop, and we might let y'all take a, a little longer break, maybe 20 minutes, and then we'll move over to the next one. Uh, but we have these different devices that we generate these sensors, digital sensors. So digital sensors, uh, we have AC sensors. And these are going to use a device called a triac, or they're going to use a device called a relay. A lot of people, y'all know what relay? Everybody okay with relay? Y'all have those. So what do we do with those things? But we use a, we use an electro, we use a current, right? To either open and close contact. Uh, but the problem we have with relays is they're electromechanical. Now, what does electromechanical mean? What's the problem with electromechanical devices? You got moving parts. So, one thing, the speed that they operate. There's no relays that can operate over high speed. Uh, we got some of our PLCs. Uh, we got a Micrologic 1100 PLC, and they use relay outputs. Uh, one of the features of that PLC is what they call a pulse train output. Where you can actually make it generate a square wave. We can't do it with that with that one because it's got relay outputs, and it cannot handle a high speed output. So if I'm going to do high speed stuff with with these guys, then we're going to have to move from electromechanical over to truly electronic. And that's what a triac is. A triac it, it's a basically we can make it act like a solid state relay. Uh, we can either turn that sucker on and pass AC or we can turn it off and it does it what? It blocks it. But it does it electronically. It does not do it with a relay. Which means all of a sudden uh, so over here we got two ways this thing can fail. It can fail what? Electrically, or it can fail mechanically. Plus, how fast can we switch a relay? Huh? Not near as fast as you think. Because once you pick a relay up, so let's say it takes, 
Let's say it takes 100 volts to pick the relay up. Well, when you drop below 100 volts, that relay is not going to drop out. So relays have what we call a pull-in voltage, and they have what they call a drop-out voltage. So what it means is to make the thing drop out, you have to, so it might pull in at 100 volts, but once you've got, so when you pull that thing in, you got to pull that armature up through a gap, right? You understand? And then it comes up and clamps on to that other side of that magnet. Now we've already there. We don't, we don't have that space we got to pull it in. So it might not drop out. So we got these guys, uh, we do a lab in motor controls and we have problems with it because, uh, well, did y'all do the one where you put two, two lights in series with each other and you're supposed to press both of them and it was supposed to drop out? Well, it wouldn't drop out. Most of, some of them would and some of them wouldn't. So what would happen is it, it, we would drop that coil down, pulled in at about 90 volts, and it dro didn't drop out to 40. So that means your input signal, it might take this voltage to pull it in, but then when it starts dropping, you got to go through that dead band, right? You understand, before it does what? Drops out. So that means you, if you're sitting there trying to switch that thing at a megahertz, you can't do it. It will never do it. It either won't pull in, it will either won't pull in because you don't have the voltage on there long enough for that armature to move, or it won't drop out because you don't drop it down below 40 volts. So relays are notorious about how fast you can switch them. Uh, a track by George, if you turn that sucker off, it does what? It, it's got a switching capabilities down in the nanosecond. So what it means now is we can generate some of our really high speed outputs that we cannot do it in relays. Now one of the most popular methods now to control DC motors is something called pulse width modulation. And as soon as I say pulse, it means that's high frequency, right? You understand that? We cannot do that with relay output. <laughs> so even though the 1100 has the ability to do pulse, uh, pulse width modulation, we can't do it with the ones we've got because the one we bought, we bought with relay output. Y'all understand that? Uh, now the advantage of relay outputs is you don't, they don't care if you put DC or AC on. So our PLC can either switch AC or it can switch DC, it don't care. Uh, if you got a track, you, it does not switch DC, it would only work with what? AC. You know. So these sensors are either going to be AC or DC. And DC, uh, if they're relay, it don't care. Uh, but uh, here we're going to use these uh, bipolar transistors, and these guys are going to be real fast. So the big advantage of, uh, of uh, solid state uh, sensors is one thing is they're less susceptible to failure because only one thing can fail, right? And then they can respond a lot faster. And we talked about single ended, right? A single ended beam. We use two wires, but we reference one to what? Ground. Now, what we do on differential is we use two wires, but neither wire is referenced to ground. Now, you say, well, I've got to have a difference in potential. Well, what we do is we send the signal, and I'll do a digital signal because it's easier to see, but we could also do this in analog. So we got one wire that's taking this. This is the actual signal. And what we do on the other wire is we send the opposite. It's actually inverted, 180 degrees out of phase. Now, if I was doing this with analog, it would be the same way. It's just that I would, it's a little harder to draw because it's, it's always. So what we do is we always have, a, we always have a difference in potential. So we have the ability to have a current flow. Now the current flow is not very much. Now what they do on one wire, they use that symbol for the non-inverted, they use that symbol for the invert. And this is what people get into problems, is let's say the plus and minus, and they think this is the negative and that's the positive. No, it's just a, that, that cross is just a symbol and we can use it to represent all kinds of things, right? You understand? Uh, so the plus is the inverted, I'm sorry, the, the plus is the uninverted, and the minus is the, this symbol, I shouldn't even say plus, minus. This is the what? Non-inverted, non this is the inverted. Now, what we came out with over time, and we came out with a, a special amplifier, and if you can take the second electronics course, we've got it over, it's called a differential amplifier.
Now, what the differential amplifier does, it only amplifies, it only passes signals that are moving in the opposite direction. So if I come over here and I pass a, if we, if we couple these wires together, we use what we call twisted pairs. So these wires are actually twisted together. So that means if you get a, if you get a magnetic flux, uh, pulse that goes through both of them, it, it, the same pulse is going to go through the second one, right? You understand? But what that would do is that would generate a pulse right here and it would generate a pulse right there. But notice those are not moving in opposite directions. Those are moving in what? The same directions. Uh, these have became known as common mode signals. So what a differential amplifier does is it rejects what? Common mode signal. And it passes what? Differential signal. And they call it a common mode rejection ratio, and we're lock, we're looking at. Uh, it might not mean anything to you, but some of these things have like a 30 dB, a thousand, a thousandths, a thousandths of a common mode signal would get through. If it's got a 30 dB uh, common mode rejection ratio, so basically what we've done with differential is we give us the ability to go back to voltage. These guys are almost immune to the electrical interference. Right, you understand? USB, universal serial bus, that's what, common mode. Ethernet, hardwired Ethernet, we can run these things 100 meters, 330 feet, not worry about it through the ceiling, not worry much about all these wires and stuff because it uses differential interface. Now in the industry, they'll go to a shielded uh, so we have, uh, they call this uh, twisted pair. We have UTP. What do you think UTP stands for? Unshielded twisted pair, yeah. And I'll show y'all, uh, I got a bunch of stuff to show y'all. Uh, pair, okay, UTP. Then we have STP. Guess what STP stands for? That's not the racer's edge, right? So this is shielded twisted pair. Usually in industry, you're going to run into STP cables because there is a, in an in industry and application, there is all types of EMI. You think about all those motors and all the stuff that's moving around, uh, there's a lot of EMI. So normally in, uh, in, uh, industrial application, we'll use STP. In, in, in commercial applications, we'll use it. And that's what we run through here. So if we have to drop these things down, you see, well, before we ran wireless, so wireless, we, not, normally we use wireless now, but for a long time we had wired uh, networks in there, and we had these cables dropping down all over. So if you go in the office over in there, you'll see a, 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 twi a unshielded twisted pair cable. Uh, in industry, you'll probably see shielded twisted pair. But now what we've done is we gave us the ability to get away from current loop, right? Back to what? Back to voltage. And these guys are high impedance, which means they use very little current. They're very efficient. The less current you use, the less power it's going to take to run the system. So high impedance, uh, high resistance. Y'all understand impedance? Have y'all heard that term before? Y'all had AC? So what's impedance? It's not resistance. It's the opposition to a changing current, not to a steady state current. It's, it's opposition to a changing current. Uh, so uh, impedance only comes into play with uh, have you had AC, Gary? Gary? Well, what we do in AC is we run, we later run, today. huh? Later today. Oh, okay. You'll, you'll get into it. Truly, impedance is, uh, uh, so we have electronic devices where their opposition varies with frequency. They don't vary with, with, with in, we, we run up with changing, so these are changing signals, right? You understand? So these would definitely be changing signals. Even though they're digital, they would definitely be changing signals. So anytime we have a changing signal, then we're going to have to deal with what we call impedance. Impedance causes weird, weird things to happen, and you'll learn that in a AC. Uh, but these are caused by devices called capacitors and inductors. You know? They don't do any electrical work. They don't do, they don't generate power. They don't get hot. But they cause a, they cause a voltage drop. So they appear to have resistance, but they don't have resistance. 
So these guys don't get hogs. They're really, really neat. So uh, the higher the frequency, uh, so uh, I don't think, we'll talk about it later on. We'll, we'll look at what we call impedance matching, which will be important to, uh, to understand when we get into these things that use these different signals or these signals that vary uh, uh, how we do these cables. So if you ever run into twisted pair cable, don't run twisted. Because what happens is when you untwist it, you change what we call the characteristics impedance of the cable, which means that's going to cause all types of problems. So you need to try to keep it in the twist as well, as much as you possibly can. Don't twist it anymore. And don't twist it any less because the, the how many turns you have per inch actually is part that sets the impedance of the cable. But what what happens when we start sending signals, especially especially varying signals, is that so if I was to come over here and I was and I'm gonna just put a digital source. So every signal source, every signal source is gonna have a internal resistance. Every signal source. It's impossible. I can't even generate electricity. So every generator has internal resistance. Now it's hard to see on a generator because a generator has what we call a voltage regulator on it. It's real easy to see on a battery. So you can take a car battery, you can take an old headlight, and you can put your voltmeter across that battery, you could hook that headlight on it, and the voltage would drop. Well, where's the voltage dropping at? It's not dropping, you're measuring it for battery, right? You understand? So what's dropping the voltage? Well, that's the internal resistance of the battery. So every signal source now on generators, what we do is we have a regulator that if the output voltage tries to drop, the regulator puts more energy in the source to cause the output voltage to go back up. So regulators compensate for the internal resistance of your alternator. But signal sources don't have regulators. So what happens if I try to put current through that resistor, what's going to happen? It's going to drop a voltage, right? So this is why I can take a, a C cell battery and I can put my voltmeter across it. And as soon as I put a resistor across it, what's going to happen? Well, the output voltage is going to drop down because of the internal resistance. But what I do with a signal source is I'm trying to send, let's say, a voltage. And then I'm trying to send this to a wire. And then when I bring this into my controller or my computer, it's going to see another resistor over here, right? You all understand that? Okay, so say, let's say this over here is 100 ohms. And then over here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a 10 ohm. Then I'm going to put a 100 ohm. So I'm going to vary my load. And then I'll, let's say I'm going to put a 1,000 ohm. Which one of them, which one of these, would give me the maximum power transfer to where I'm trying to get it to? We're not talking about that guy up there. This is where I'm trying to get it to. Which one would I get the maximum power over here to? Okay. Okay, so how many people say 10? Eric's the only one? Two, three, okay. How many people say 100? How many people say 1,000? Power to the load. So where am I trying to get this signal to? I'm not trying to get it here. I'm trying to get it right there. Everybody understand that? Everybody okay? Okay, so let's put the 10 ohm in there. And let's calculate how much power we get to the 10 ohm. So what we'll use is we'll use the voltage divider formula because it's a lot easier. What's the voltage divider formula? Anybody know? V across any resistor is equal to that resistor, which would be 10 ohms, divided by the total resistance in the circuit. That's 110 ohms. And then I'll multiply that times the volt by the applied voltage. So let's make this 10 volts. And what's so neat about the voltage divider formula, this is for series circuits. This is not for parallel circuits because parallel circuits is the, so in parallel circuits, we have what we call a current divider formula. So what we can do is if I've got, I could calculate the voltage drop across any resistor in a series circuit without calculating current. Because the, the amount of, the amount of voltage that 10 ohm drops 
is relative to the other resistors in the circuit. And I could put this on a test. I, I could put it on the test. So I could say, okay, I've got a 10 ohm resistor and I got a 100 ohm resistor. How much current flow, how much voltage would the 10 ohms off? And somebody would say 5 volts. And then I'd say, okay. In the next question, I would say, if I change that to a thousand ohm, how much voltage would the 10 ohm drop? And somebody would put the same voltage in there and say, I would say, what happens to the current? And they would say, the current would be the same because the current is the same in a series circuit. The current is not the same in all series circuits. If you change the components of the circuit, what happens? The current changes. But people get in their head is once I calculate the current of a series circuit, even if I change the circuit, they'll, they'll put the same answer because they'll say the current is constant in the series circuit. Right? So our current's going to change every time. So if I was to, what's nice about knowing this is that 10 ohm resistor will drop the same ratio no matter what the voltage is. So if I use the voltage divider formula and I put 10 volts up there, then I could calculate the voltage drop across the 10 ohm. I could say I could go to 100 volts and it's not going to change the ratio, right? You understand that? So if I take that ratio, it, it very, it, I could just change the voltage and it would change it for me. What did you do in DC if I changed the voltage? You'd recalculate the whole circuit, right? You take RT, you divide it, you take, you take DT, divide it by RT, calculate the current, multiply by that, but it doesn't make any difference. So that 100 ohm resistor is going to drop a certain ratio of the applied voltage. The 10 ohm is going to drop a certain ratio of the applied voltage. And the voltage is, is, is not unconsequential. Because once I calculate this, once I calculate this, that, that's how much that 10 ohm resistor will drop. Not, that's the ratio will drop no matter what DS is. So what do we come up with, guys? So V across the 10 ohm, what would you come up with B? We could do this, you could, and I'll show you all in a minute, we can do this with one formula. So what's, what, what power formula are we going to use? What's our three power formula? So power is equal to what? Both sides. Both sides current. What's the next one? Power is equal to I square R. Power is equal to what? Okay. So what two things do we are we calculating? What are we calculating here? Voltage. Okay. What do we know? We know the 10 ohm resistor, so we use that. So I can I can combine these two formulas and come up with the answer. So I could say I could say 10 divided by 110, right? Then I'd say times what? 10. Then what would I hit on my calculator? Square, and then I'd come up and hit divide, and I'd say 10, and you can give me the answer. So you want me to see me do that once? So what would I do? So I'm going to say 10 divided by 110. And I'm going to do what? Equals. And I'm going to do what with that? What am I going to do that? I'm going to say times what? Times 10 equals, right? You understand that. Then I'm going to do what? Square it, right? Okay. Then I'm going to divide this by 10. So that's 82.6 milliwatts. So my 10 ohm gave me what? Bitch. 82.6 milliwatts. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll come up here and we'll change this out and put the 100 on. And I'll just work these out. So I, what I need to do is come up here and write to and you. And what's nice about using the voltage divider for me, a lot of times you can calculate RT in your head. So what am I going to do this time? I'm going to say 100 over 200, right? You understand that? And I'm going to multiply that by what? 10. Then what am I going to do? Square that, and I'm going to divide that by 100. No, because it's by, it's by the resistor. Yeah, V square of R. 
So here I come up here. So I'll come up here. I'm going to say uh, 0.5 times 10. That's the voltage, right? Equals that. I'm going to come up here. I'm going to square it. And I'm going to divide that by 100. And we got 250 milliwatts. So anybody that answered 10 got it wrong. See that? If I understand that. So here we had 82.6. Here we got 250 milliwatts to the load. Okay, so what would the next one be? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say what? I'm going to say 1,000 divided by 1,100. Uh, then I'm going to multiply that times 10. Then I'm going to do what? I'm going to square it. And I'm going to divide that by 1,000. Okay, so it's going to be 1,000. Divided by 1100 equals that times 10 equals that. Oops, messed up. <laughs> I'm coming up with a bigger number than I started off with. 1000 divided by 1100 equals that. I'm going to multiply that times 10. I was right. Times 10 equals that. And I'm going to divide that by 1000. Oh my goodness, equals to 9 million. So when did we get the maximum power transfer from my signal source to my load? When the resistance breaks. So what we do in communication are signals. We try to, instead of this being arbitrary, what we do is we, we establish the impedance of the system. And if I establish the impedance of the system, then we get what we call maximum power transfer. This is a technique called impedance matching. CE matching. So if I have an, if I have an impedance matching in a, in a, in a, between my source and my destination, we get maximum power transfer. Does that make sense? So instead of setting this arbitrarily, they go ahead and set the impedance of your system. Uh, like the impedance of your cable TV. It's a, it uses the coaxial cable. Uh, that's a 50 ohm cable. Now, if you measured it, with your own meter, it's going to measure infinity because this is not a resistance, this is an impedance. This only occurs if you put a change in signal on it. Right? So inside that cable is set up so it has capacitance and inductance. It's a savage to reset that cable at 50 ohms. So if you was to go out there and put 10 megahertz on that cable, then you would you measured all the current and everything, it would be what? Well, measure out if the impedance is 50 ohms. So if they set the impedance of these devices at a certain impedance and we match it on the input, then what that means is we get maximum power transfer. So when we get over to the line and we start looking at the, uh, we start looking at the, uh, and I'll show you all several examples over there. When we look at the Amatro line, uh, we'll notice that it's got these big blocks on there. And uh, it's got these switches on where you can either turn them on or off. But what you're doing is you're setting the impedance of the you're setting impedance of the system. And so Profibus has a certain impedance, and what we do is we have to terminate it with what we call a terminating resistor because that uses what we call a bus topology. Uh, in networking, a topology is the way you connect things. Uh, so a bus topology is we would take one common media. And then these guys would come on and do what? You know, that would be, this, this is called to a trunk. Uh, the one they're using on the Amatrol line is they're using what they call a daisy chain. So what they do is they have a cable that runs from this one 
and then it'll piggyback on another cable and it'll run to that one. And then it'll piggyback on another cable and run to that one. And we call this a daisy chain. You understand what I'm saying? And what we have to do is that this right here is just shielded pair cable. Uh, and so what we do is we set the impedance of the cable. So what we do over here, if there's a resistor in here, and you have to do that on both ends. So what you do is you literally switch a resistor in that sets the watt, sets the impedance of the cable or resistance of the network so we get maximum watt. Power transfer, not current, not current, maximum power. Ethernet, uh, Ethernet, where we run these cables in, uh, it's, it's matched inside the actual end units. Uh, Ethernet uses what we call, uh, it predominantly uses what we call a star topology. We'll look at that too. Where we come up here, we have a, a general unit used to call a switch. And then uh, your different devices will be out here. And then what you do is the impedance, since we know that, then the impedance is actually set in the cable and inside the, uh, inside the devices. But a, a bus topology, uh, you have to set those inside the unit. Does that make sense? So uh, your TV is basically a bus topology. Uh, so when you come up here and you screw that into the back of your TV, the impedance is matched inside your TV. So you can't go out there and get regular wire and bring it into your coaxial input. You can't hook a regular antenna up to that, right? You understand? Yeah. I don't know if y'all remember the old antennas that we put on our, our houses. It had that twin plex cable and it was separated by a certain distance. It was a, it was a brown cable and that was, uh, I think, 300 on. You had to bring it into your antenna input on your this. If the cable ever broke, I went out to my father's house and he he tried to make one of the screens in his house his his, uh, his antenna, <laughs> and he, he couldn't understand why he got such a crummy picture. Unless he went by, he went back there and touched it. Well, when he touched it, he was in parallel and he more matched he more matched the input impedance of his antenna. He got a better picture. Well, see, your screen wire has your screen wire don't have the right impedance on it. Yeah. So if you didn't, if you just tried to use regular, people would go out and get regular. They needed a longer. They wanted to put their antenna somewhere, and they had, well, this has got two wires, so they'd go out and buy an extension cord, and they'd do what? They'd twist it on there, and then they'd take that extension cord and hook it up to their TV, and they couldn't understand why they got such a crummy picture because they did what? Yeah. Well, I always go on to touch rabbit ears and they get a lot better, but that's different. Okay, are we okay? So that, that was a little bit. So what we're doing is, is in our cables, our cables are going to have certain impedance, and then it's going to depend on that. You know? So most of your sensors are going to have special cables built out that will bring all the way back to the, uh, the terminal. So let's go ahead and take about a 20-minute break, guys. What time does this class go to? 12.30? Okay, that'll give us about an uh, that'll give us about an hour over there, and we can go over. There and I'm gonna show y'all uh, the, the the impedance matching thing. What else did I show you? I was gonna show y'all. Gonna show y'all different sensors. What else? I, huh? We are, but we, I told y'all uh, there's several things. I was, oh, the digital oscilloscope. Actually, you can actually see the A to D converter inside the scope. You can actually see the steps. So an analog scope, it gives you a really nice uh, sine wave. A digital scope is going to break it up into watch steps. So, I know the mechatronics lab. I know y'all know where that's at. So we'll see y'all over there. No, it'd be y'all go ahead and take a break. I got to shut this down and get this all ready. So.